good morning i hope all of you had a great monday yesterday uh, so let's get started with today's agenda and i hope you were also able to go through the documentation that i had given yesterday on uh, uh, the serverless architecture right and you were able to understand what is the uh, usp of using a serverless architecture versus a traditional architecture right so today we will continue our class a little more on the other components of serverless architecture okay and uh, let's go over from there okay i'm just going to pull up my screen did any of you try any lambda function yesterday uh, hello world lambda function okay <clears throat> no problem so we'll try that out but before we get into uh, some some amount of hands on lab what i'm going to do is i'm going to explain a few more topics to you all okay um cognito right cognito is basically a, a aws service it is used for as i said yesterday it's used for a uh, uh, single sign on and it's used to uh, basically uh, you know allow access to your applications a single sign on access to your applications and provides an authentication service okay and also it supports the ability to uh, uh, you know integrate with uh, social providers such as google facebook twitter amazon uh and so on and so forth and uh, and 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 you know what it, it basically simplifies your entire uh, sign up process right if if you are building an application and you need a user sign up and you need a place where the users can get authenticated and get a token saml okay how many of you know what a saml is s a m l raise your hands s a m l saml no not really okay so saml is a it's called security assertion markup language saml is a very very important topic you know you can you can just you know learn learn saml okay so in fact it's saml is a uh is the standard de facto way of uh, um you know representing uh, or or rather it's used for uh, you know authentication and uh, single sign on okay it's basically a open standard primarily it's called security assertion markup language so an open standard for exchanging authentication and authorization data between multiple parties so usually you have an identity provider and a service provider so now for example i'm building an application i'm the service provider uh, where, whereas you know i want to uh, depend on say google or amazon or facebook uh, you know for my users identities then they become the identity provider so now there is something which is needed between these two to negotiate the authentication in a very secure way right so that's where if you see saml uh, um Um, you know comes into picture right and uh, it's basically a um, protocol that helps uh, exchange authentication information between multiple systems and also it uses single sign on it provides you a single sign on ability what is single sign on single sign on is a mechanism with which uh, you allow the users to sign on only once or rather you let the users sign on only once 
what are the other applications that depend on that credentials get signed in automatically you don't have to keep popping up the uh, the authentication challenge every time okay like it's like once they log in after that it's it's just available for them right like for example there are a few websites where if you have used google uh, as an authentication okay google credentials or facebook credentials next time when you log into the website it does not ask you for um, the uh, uh, ask you for again logging into using google right because it takes it, the cookies store the your browser cookies store the authentication information and from there it basically takes the um, uh, it takes the uh, credentials and then it passes the credentials to the website okay that's called saml right it's very important you learn this saml or, or at least understand you know what saml does right i mean it's it's very important because this is a um uh, this is a this is an important interview question okay they they may ask you you know how do you uh, perform authentication i mean what protocol is used to perform authentication in a uh, in a modernized application modernized cloud based application right uh, you know you should you should immediately say that uh, you know saml is being used right saml uh, will uh, saml will be the protocol which is used and then you should be able to speak about saml at least at a very high level right so that's that's good enough you don't have to go deep but at least at a high level understand what saml is right if you see here you have a service provider you have a an user agent and an identity provider right so this is how the saml authentication goes on <clears throat> okay saml is for uh, you know um, primarily for you know uh, using exchanging the authentication information and providing single sign on user experience to your end users okay all right so cognito cognito is a service that lets you users sign up sign in and access control to your web and mobile apps quickly and easily amazon's cognito scales to millions of users and supports sign in with social identity providers such as facebook google and amazon and enterprise identity providers via saml 2.0 right 2.0 is the latest version that you know uh, saml is there and the cognito supports saml saml is a open standard right i mean lot of identity providers make use of saml okay so then let's quickly look at the features of cognito uh, so basically cognito provides one directory for all your apps and users right so basically it has something called user pools uh, it provides a secure user directory that scales to hundreds of millions of users and it's a fully managed service uh, where uh, you know you don't have to worry about setting up the underlying infrastructure setting up the middleware setting up patching backup and things like that it's a fully managed service where you just go configure cognito uh, and uh, set up your user pool and integrate it with your application you are good right you are kind of set all set you don't have to worry about anything else whereas in a traditional application development right i mean since uh, i've done a lot of application development in the past and i'm still doing it i know the pain of setting up a identity mechanism for your application Okay, because and I'm sure you know a lot of our uh, mentors and uh, brothers who are there, you know the brothers sisters who are there, who are from the application development background, they know the pain of setting up an identity um, uh, mechanism for your application because it's not that easy, right? I mean, you you take even a Spring-based application, right? How many of you built a Spring-based Java application? Raise your hands. yeah z011 okay all right uh, so so in in a in a spring based java web application uh, you must have seen that uh, how difficult it is to set up the authentication mechanism and also you need to build that entire logic right i mean if you are doing something on your own you have to build that entire logic within your application or use some open source component you know which provides you the ability to create users right manage the life cycle of users 
uh, and also pass that user information you know when users log in right z011 can you talk a little about more about that if based on your experience but uh, i don't uh, exactly remember but uh, it is open source but there is a lot of uh, biolabet logic uh, yeah they can yeah. Uh, uh, spring has provide uh, punjab classes mm -hmm. uh, okay there's something called spring security module do you know about it I don't learn spring security. Uh, only yeah. I don't practical spring security. Okay, so there's something called a spring. Thank you, Sir Jiro One one. So there's something called spring security module. Okay. Anyways, I just took a random example, but every other programming or application framework would have such um, complexities in it, right? So it's always not easy and possible to build something on your own. Okay. Um, so in this case, you get a complete directory for all your applications and users. So you can use that, uh, say tomorrow, as I said, no, you want to build a mobile app and you want a authentication mechanism for your mobile app, right? You can just use Cognito and your users could actually get authenticated through Cognito. Okay. And it also supports mobile devices, right? Yeah. And Microsoft Active Directory, as I said earlier, is in another directory service, which is used by enterprises. Um, so it can also integrate with Active Directory and using SAML. Okay, so that's that's about, um, uh, you know, Cognito. And, uh, you know, uh, in, and, you know, you can just read through more about Cognito on a few user examples and things like that. And there are some online videos. Yeah. Create your first project, write your first client, dive deep into Cognito. You can just. Let me just share my screen again. Just give me a second. share my screen with sound enabled. <clears throat> okay. Webinar. Deep dive on user sign up and sign in with Amazon Cognito. Our presenter today is Tim Hunt. Tim is a senior product manager for Amazon Cognito. We up with some use cases to summarize the different ways your mobile apps. We've got Amazon SNS. And then for structured data, we've got DynamoDB and RDS, relational database services. A lot of areas around user management as well. So these are the three core areas. You can configure these identity providers in Cognito, and Cognito will take it from there essentially. So as you can see in the illustration, you've got verify the, the user through email, it's going to be when I ask Cognito to authenticate my user. User attributes into the local profile, and these also then get passed through the tokens that your app receives. Now, once you've created a factor authentication, so I could allow users a gateway in resources, okay. some creative name, and then step through the settings. You've got different options you can use for how you want your users to sign up. Traditionally, you can use a username. And in addition to that, you can say if they've got an email address, they can use that as well to sign in. Or you can also simplify that and just use an email address directly without having a separate username that you have to provide. Yeah. So this is how you create a user pool, right? And you can specify multiple settings, such as how you want your users to register using their email address, phone number, or both email address, phone number, right? And you want users to get verified, you know, once they register an email address, once they register using the email address and things like that, right? I mean, it's it's quite intuitive and it's quite useful. It's it's all like, it, it's like you can do it yourself. You don't need any help actually, right? You just need to follow 
the videos that are here and uh, you can you can just achieve all of this yourself right uh, pricing wise there is there is a free tier for cognito okay a cognito user pool uh, has a free tier of 50000 maus uh, um, who sign in directly to cognito and 50 maus for users federated to saml 2.2 based or identity providers okay so if you are a cognito if you are using if you are using cognito identity to create a user pool you pay monthly based on your monthly active users maus only user is counted as an mau if within a calendar month there is an identity operation related to that user such as sign up sign in token refresh or password change you are not charged for subsequent sessions or for inactive users within that calendar month there is separate pricing for users who sign in directly with their credentials from user pool and for users who sign in through a enterprise directory through saml federation okay so there is a free tier available right so you can always test it it's quite intuitive in fact we are going to do that uh, sometime okay that's cognito okay and uh, we'll come back to cognito uh, in a while let's go to secrets manager secrets manager okay so secrets manager right i mean what does secrets manager mean as the name says it can manage maintain secrets it does not reveal the secrets okay anyways so when when you build applications uh, you need to secure certain assets of your application okay uh, very strongly right otherwise if you don't secure them if there is a vulnerability to the application or if there is a vulnerability on the underlying infrastructure or if there is a vulnerability on the operating system like the one that i said right the open ssl one hard bleed right if there is a vulnerability then a hacker can take away all the important secure assets of your application and use those assets to uh, steal data steal your data i'll give a simple example uh, all of us did uh, our uh, wordpress exercise correct yeah so all of us did our wordpress exercise in our wordpress exercise what did we do i'll just pull up the document uh we edited the wp config.php in word www.html and then we modified these following lines correct so what does this have this has the database name well and good database user what is the username password all these are stored in plain text within the wp config.php correct so now which is not the best practice correct because uh, what if somebody gains access to that ec2 instance and somebody logs into the wp config.php he can get the username password and then he can direct directly log into the database using mysql client and he can access the important tables uh, further for example imagine if, a, uh, if the application is storing pass uh, credit card details or ssn numbers or other card details correct uh, and uh, imagine you know there are Uh, 10 million other card details which are stored in a table or 10 million credit card details are stored in a table right uh, it's like a bounty for a person who is looking for it right who is trying to hack this information so they can they can straight away log into the database and just take the take away the data in a wink of an eye so ideally you should not let that happen right so that's where if you see usually when you build applications you have to build uh, the applications in a very secure way where you don't expose sensitive password related information or credentials related information uh, you, you should never store that in a uh, in a plain text file like this 
right where you know anybody and everybody you know who has access to it will be able to read it rather use secrets manager aws secrets manager secrets manager is a service with which you will be able to uh, you know uh, you, you'll be able to store the secrets needed to access your application such as usernames passwords right credentials like access key secret key also right you can also store that if your application is uh, using an access key secret key to access an s3 bucket you don't have to hard code it in an you know in a, in, a uh, uh, in in the local file right you, you can either use iam role or if you don't want to use iam role you can store that in a uh, bare minimum store it in the secrets manager advantages here you know you'll be able to easily rotate manage and retrieve database credentials api keys and other secrets throughout their life cycles life cycle users and applications retrieve secrets with a call to secrets manager api so every time it makes a call to the secrets manager api uh, using the key right so key is basically the secrets key and value returns the value uh, it it makes a call to the secrets manager api uh, so you don't have to hard code hard coding is a very common terminology the you should never hard code you should never a uh, hard code anything in your code because uh, wherever possible right you should make it a configuration okay where without needing to change the code because usually uh, you know maintaining the code is quite difficult okay because because of the uh, overhead involved with maintaining the code right so where if you have to maintain a piece of code Uh, then you have to have the right skills who can maintain the code number one developers number two you also need testers whenever a code change happens as per the process you should test it thoroughly right end to end all the test test cases will have to be executed i mean it doesn't matter whether uh, a specific code change impacts only one functionality okay but as as a best practice you have to test entire thing whole thing end to end okay so so given given these complexities and given these uh additional uh, things which are required uh, you know you should you should not hard code any information in your code right you should never hard code usernames passwords and within your code right uh, which requires you to recompile when the username password changes right so then that breaks the entire functionality correct so that's where if you see you should never hard code and you should store them in secrets manager secrets manager offers secret rotation with public built with built in integration for rds redshift document db and so on and so forth uh, so so you you can also allow only like certain authorized people to access the secrets manager through iam okay through fine grain to fine grain uh, permissions okay um, so now you'll be able to rotate your secrets safely right so for example um you want to keep rotating your iam uh, credentials okay secret key and access key once in a while correct every 3 months you want to keep rotating so you can rotate it and you can update it in the secrets manager that way secrets manager can uh, it it can allow you to rotate secrets in a very very secure way okay uh, and then it's all stored in a very central way and also it's pay as you go and right? it's on number of api calls that you make to the secret secrets manager you get charged for that yeah so this is the faq page where you use a programmatic way of retrieval of secrets and you can also audit and monitor the secrets usage and right? who all are using the secrets centrally right and how many times the api calls are being made and all of that demographics and the telemetry can be gathered and monitored complaints okay so basically there are so many complaints standards that have been established in the uh, in the world right so where uh, for example all of us use credit cards right day in day out um so when we use credit cards our credit card information gets stored in the website that we are actually using the credit card correct because you have to give your card number name expiry date and cvv so that the transaction gets validated 
and uh, you know the payment is made through my credit card okay so that's pretty much the entire process correct so any website that you go you know asks for i mean any online shopping or any e-commerce websites you know request asks you for a credit card when you give the credit card details and then they process the data right and they also store the credit card details for future use right so maybe if you prefer to some websites will ask store this card for faster checkout right when you store the credit card when you check that uh, that website stores that credit card for a faster checkout next time okay so in such cases what happens is uh, they such websites or such e-commerce portals or whatever such applications are subject to pci dss it's a compliance payment card industry data security standard if you see this i have highlighted this that is the compliance standard that that specific website has to adhere to right and pci dss is a standard and it's a compliance so now there are audits that can happen for pca compliance pca dss compliance right and now uh, you know you uh, you know you have to engage a auditor you know who can audit your the way you are you are storing the data credit card information and uh, whether the underlying infrastructure and all the other best practices the security posture best practices uh, do they all adhere to you know the pci dss standards right it's basically a way to ensure that you know the consumers details pii details or credit card information is not stolen and will not get uh, will not be stolen right they will not be you know vulnerable so that's the whole idea of these compliance requirements right uh, similarly i've got multiple sock is another compliance requirement for financial services right uh, hipaa is basically for um, uh, health right i mean it's basically a health insurance based uh, uh, compliance right so where if you if if you are if you are a health care provider and you are storing data about your consumers or about your patients or about your customers uh, you have to ensure that you follow the hipaa standards okay so now so basically if you see uh, you can use aws secrets manager to manage secrets for workloads that are subject to all these complaints right i mean so so what it means is secrets manager adheres to all these complaint standards right you don't have to worry about it right especially about storing the credentials which is accessing the database you don't have to worry about it because it follows all these standards so you don't have to do anything on your own right you just focus only on building your application code with a peace of mind that it's sec- it will be secure yeah you can so it does not have a free tier but it has a 30 day trial period okay so your free trial trial starts when you store your first secret for one month it is free after that it's charged it is charged at 0.4 which is like 40 cents per secret per month okay so for example if i'm storing say 10 secrets in secrets manager uh then it is 4 dollars 4 dollars per month okay and then it's it's like about 5 cents per 10000 apa calls right and i'm invoking say 10000 or maybe i'm invoking say uh 50000 uh, apa calls in every month to secrets manager to retrieve my five secrets okay so in that case uh, i would end up paying about uh, uh, 25 cents okay it's like 5 cents per 10000 calls right so I'll, i would end up paying about 25 cents yeah so if any any of you want to try you can try but imagine um, this is Uh, remember this is only for 30 day trial period okay you can only use it free for 30 days 
you don't get it month on month like unlike the other services like ec2 you get 750 hours right month on month whereas here you don't get month on month you get only for 30 days and then it is 40 cents per secret per month that's the charge yeah there's some example that there is given ssh keys ssh keys database credentials you know you can store any anything in that it's very secure okay <clears throat> Okay, all right. So that's that's on the secrets manager. So that's what I wanted to uh, uh, discuss once today. And then let's also look at SQ as an SNS. Okay, so SQ as is a simple queue service, right? So where uh, you have you need a queue right so where you want to process several messages that are coming in whereas you don't want to uh, delay the processing and and you want a decoupled way of integrating your application with other applications right like for example i the the, the list that the example that i gave yesterday right so where you go to a place, a public place, there is a queue system, correct? Uh, because, you know, the uh, you go and buy a ticket, right? Now you go and buy a ticket. Uh, there, there are only, like, say, five counters, five ticket counters, but there are 500 people waiting in the waiting outside, right? So now not all 500 people can just go and barge into the ticket counter, correct? Because the ticket counter, the person who's sitting in the ticket counter, that employee, can only process one ticket at a time. And he would take about two minutes to issue the ticket. Correct. Uh, so now, given such a scenario, right, there are five, uh, uh, you know, ticket counters and uh, each ticket counter would take two minutes per ticket, issuing one ticket. And there are 500 people, right? Obviously, there will be five queues. Right? Each queue, each will be queued. Like, for example, 100, 100 people will stand in each queue right and each person would take about two minutes then the ticket agent will process the ticket and send him out it's like first in first out correct uh, in a in a similar way in distributed systems uh, which needs loose coupling and which needs uh, processing of messages and which uh, do not want to bombard the other system with so many messages at any given point in time and knowing that you know the target system won't be able to withstand that load right in such a case uh, what happens is uh, you you use a sqs which is simple queue service uh, which has a ability to decouple and scale the microservices distributed systems architecture and serverless applications uh, it eliminates the complexity and overhead associated with managing and operating message volume. Yes. So everything is a message out here, right? And uh, it um, the message goes there, it gets stored in the queue, and then the queue processes it, processes it using a target logic, and then it removes it from the queue once it is processed. Okay, so there are different types of message queues, standard queues, and FIFO queues, right? What is the standard queue? Standard queue offers a maximum throughput uh, and uh, you know where it guarantees at least one's delivery. But there are possibilities that a message can be delivered multiple times also. I gave you another example, right? SMS. When you want to send an SMS, it, it is basically a queued service. Your SMS service that you're using can only process say 100 SMSs per minute, okay? Whereas, uh, you know, you want, uh, uh, you, your application is actually sending say 200 SMSs every minute. In such a case, you will 
lose sending the SMS, right? Because your SMS service will, is not capable of handling 200 SMSs per minute. So in such a case, you can put a queue in the middle and then you can pass it through the queue. Queue will send in a batches of 100, 100 messages every minute so that you are guaranteed that all the messages would be reach, reaching your consumers. Uh, so in, in this case, in a standard queue, uh, you know, the, the standard queue guarantees at least once delivery, but it is possible that it may also repeat the delivery once again, or more than once, right? SMS which has gone, it's, there is a possibility that it can go again, once again. That is a possibility. Like sometimes, you know, you may wonder, you, have, you get the same SMS more than once. Right, from certain websites or from say from banks or when you withdraw money and things like that, right? You may wonder why is it coming again? Uh, in such case, you know, probably it's using a standard queue because standard queue provides the maximum yeah. throughput, and it, um, it 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 you know guarantees at least once delivery, but it's uh, but it's kind of uh, you know not sure you know whether it will deliver it more than once. It can deliver it more than once. So if you're okay with that, you can go with a standard queue. And for high volumes and with maximum throughput, you know, you can go for a standard queues. Whereas if you want to guarantee exactly once delivery, you don't want your messages to be processed more than once. You want it to be exactly processed only once. Okay, in the order that they are sent. Okay, so uh, one more thing about standard queues is uh, it makes a best effort to order the messages the way they arrive, but there's no guarantee. So it may not, it may not respect that, or it may not, uh, it, it may not follow that religiously, right? Uh, it's like, you know, when messages come in for some reason, if a, if a certain message gets stuck, uh, behind that, there's one more message, which is coming. It will allow the second message to go to the first. Okay, and after some time, you know, when the first message comes back, it will behind. It will be behind the second message. Okay, uh, that's. But it, you know, it does the best effort ordering. It it makes the best effort to order the messages in the way it comes. But there is no guarantee that messages will deliver will be delivered in the way it comes in the order it comes. So if you don't care about it, and if you really are not worried about it because you are for you, every message has equal priority. It's not that one message comes first, this other message comes next. If you have such a situation, you can always go for standard queues and uh, where you don't ca care about the number of times it gets delivered and the order in which they arrive, right? Because usually queues are first in, first out, right? So in some cases, you know, it, it may be like whichever message comes second, maybe first out. Okay, uh, but if you really care about all of this, then FIFO queues are the way to go about. SQS offers another queue type called FIFO, F-I-F-O, first in, first out. That guarantees messages to be delivered exactly once, processed exactly once, in the exact order that they are sent. I am sending like one to 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. It will exactly come in the same order and it will go out in the same order. Yeah. Yeah, and these are some of the benefits, right? And also it can scale elastically and cost effectively, right? And it can delay, reliably deliver the messages um, because of the underlying, because it's a managed service and it's a serverless service. Um, it decouples application components so that they run and fail independently, right? Like for example, uh, you have a, SMS service and you are building an application. No, you have to, your application has to send an SMS. Okay. So now for some reason, your SMS service fails, right? If you don't have a queue system in the middle, what will happen is your application will continue to uh, invoke the SMS APIs and it will continue to keep sending the messages to the SMS service, but the SMS service is down. So what will happen is all your messages will get lost. It will go into a black hole. All your messages will get lost and you'll have an outage and those users will not receive their SMS, SMSs. 
Whereas in a disconnected architecture like this, which, you, which is using a queue in the middle, where it's a disjointed architecture, uh, and where you're decoupling the components of application through a queue, uh, it really doesn't matter, right? Because you are publishing the uh, message or the SMS to a queue, and queue mm -hmm. is trying to process it using the SMS APIs. So in this case, when you push the message to the queue, what the queue will do is queue will try to call the third party SMS API and try to process this. In this case, if it is not able to process, if it is not able to invoke that API, it will again reattempt. Okay, it will again reattempt. If it's still after a certain number of retries, what it does is it basically puts it in a bad letter queue. Okay, which can be again processed. Once the once the dependent system comes back, it will again try to process. So it's persisting the messages somewhere in a queue, right? So that you're not losing those messages. You're still having that messages. So once the, the other third party SMS system comes back, uh, it will clear off everything which is there in the queue and it will be able to push all the messages through the queue into the third party SMS system. Okay, uh, so that way it is like, it increases the overall fault tolerance of the system, right? And multiple copies of every message are stored redundantly across multiple AZs so that they are available whenever they are needed. Again, it uses a multi-AZ architecture where the SQS underlying infrastructure for SQS itself is spanning across multiple AZs. And if you publish messages, the messages are redundantly stored in other AZs as well. So that way, if one availability zone goes down, you still have the other availability zone where SQS can operate from there. Yeah, these are some of the uh, case studies of SQS, like Redbus is using SQS and SMS. See, it's a public case study. Okay, Redbus is expanding the AWS solution to include SQS and SNS for monitoring alerts and intercommunication. So all of us have used Redbus, right? All of us have used the Redbus uh, service. BMW, NASA, Capital One. So if you see, these are the two types of queues, standard queues and FIFO queues. It provides an unlimited throughput, like which is measured as transactions per second. Right? Usually throughput is measured as how many transactions per second. What is the output? That is how the throughput is basically measured. In this case, uh, it is measured as the number of messages that can pass through the queue per second or per minute, basically per second, it's TPS. And uh, in the case of uh, FIFO queues, uh, it can support up to 300 messages per second. Uh, but when you batch up 10 messages per operation, it can support 3000 messages per second. And if you still want to increase it, you can support, raise the support case and get it increased, but it can support up to 3000 messages per second. Here in this case, it's at least once delivery here exactly once, it, it exactly processes once. And here there is a chance that occasionally more than one copy of the message is delivered. And here, best effort ordering, occasionally messages might be delivered in an order different from which they were sent. But here it's precisely first in first out. One, two, three, four, five. Here, if you see one, two, five came first, then three, then four. Okay, so that's that's the, uh, and these are some of the examples basically for uh, standard Q1 FIFO Q. Here, you want, you want to prevent a student from enrolling in a course before registering for an account, correct? You have to then use this. It has to go in the right order. Okay, uh, here if you see uh, batch messages for future crossing, schedule multiple entries to be added to a database. 
you don't care i mean even if the entry gets repeated that's not a problem okay allocate tasks to multiple worker nodes process a high number of credit card validation requests okay, there's something called dead letter queues where messages that were not successfully processed goes to a dead letter queue and there are some monitoring for the dead letter queue and there's some monitoring for how many messages are being processed okay that's sqs okay pricing wise if you see it's like pay, pay for what you use there's no minimum fee uh so the way it gets processed is let's take uh, mumbai region Asia Pacific Mumbai. Yeah, for a standard queue, it is per one million requests. After free tier, it it also has a free tier. After one million requests, it is forty cents. Okay. Uh, so per for every one million requests, it is like forty cents. So which means. Point zero 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 four per request. That's the uh, price per request. Right? It's, it's like for one million requests, it's forty cents. For FIFO queue, it's slightly higher. It's fifty cents per one million requests. So see how cheap it is, right? I mean, if you want to build a application and uh, you're you you're you're processing say a million messages. Every day, right? Then you you end up paying only like forty cents every day. Forty cents is how much? Thirty rupees or thirty-five rupees per day, or forty rupees forty rupees per day. If you convert it into INR, right? So, uh, so that's the power of using a pay-per-use model, right? I mean, it's like quite. uh i mean um, aws is able to provide this at such a inexpensive rate because of the scale of economy of scale right because of the economy of scale and the underlying uh, infrastructure data center everything is shared uh, that's why you know aws is able to give this at such a competitive rates yeah there are some 10 minute tutorials that are there here also we will do those 10 minute tutorials okay today you can just read through this white papers and things like that okay so that's sqs so let me quickly look at sns and then we'll start with lambda sns is something that we have seen sns right okay sns is basically a fully managed uh, a publisher subscriber messaging to send sms notifications email notifications and mobile push notifications so amazon a simple notification service is a fully managed messaging service for both application to application and application to person communication okay the application to application pub sub functionality provides topics for high throughput push based many to many messaging between distributed systems system of microservices event driven serverless applications okay uh, and uh, um you know you can you can fan out it's called fan out where uh you want to publish a message to say multiple systems multiple applications like you want to publish a message to 10 different applications who have subscribed to your notification topic you can simply fan out you can push that message to all the 10 different applications and you know fan out methodology Okay, where it just fans out. It says it just pushes the notification to. It is like broadcasting, right? I mean, you have a broadcaster, right? So, for example, um, you know, in villages and all, uh, the local panchayat body, if they want to make some announcement to the villagers, they have they send that person, right, who will broadcast the messages using a loudspeaker, right? he will go to every street and then he will basically read out the message right it's like broadcasting correct it goes to everybody 
because he is using a loud speaker loud speaker to speak out the message it goes to everybody right so that way uh, in this case you know whoever subscribes to that will receive that message so that's called broadcasting again sns is a way to decouple your applications like sqs right sqs provides you a queue whereas sns provides a ability to send messages right send notifications using an event driven architecture which where based on an event right so for example i have i'm building an application i'm building a mobile app where in the mobile app um you know i'm uh, i'm i'm actually okay let's take the covid situation itself right i mean you have the arogya setu application things like that right but imagine you want to build an application for your community right your community has some say 1000 houses i don't every house i mean you want everybody to install that application in their mobile device okay and uh, uh the the moment if uh, somebody gets covid positive or somebody tests covid positive uh you want your app to send a notification to everybody in the community saying that so and so has tested positive and uh, to be more safe and uh, you know you are requesting everybody to be uh, you are advising everybody to be more safe right in that case i mean if say for example uh, if if say one person person x test positive what he can do is he can go he can open his app and then he can say that i'm i'm tested positive today uh, so please be careful so that's the message that he's he's saying and he's he's going to say that i'm going to quarantine myself in my house so please don't visit me for the next 15 days i'm going to quarantine myself so that message can will will be processed by your application and the, it's an event right i mean it's an event where the event is processed by your application and then it pushes that message to an sns the sns will push it to all the users who have subscribed to that topic Okay, send messages directly to millions of users. Okay, using email, SMS, uh, and uh, things like that, and it 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 also reliably delivers the messages. There's high amount of reliability. Uh, ensure accuracy and message ordering and deduplication. Right. Uh, so S S N S FIFO topics. Uh, work with SQS FIFO queues. Okay, here in the case of SNS, it's called topics, whereas in SQS they are called queues. So a topic is where there's a topic and people come and subscribe to the topic. Uh, how many of you work with Kafka? How many of you know what a Kafka is? Apache Kafka. Raise your hands. Is it zero one? Two is it? Is it zero one one? Is it zero one two? Or did you guys raise your hands earlier? Yes, sir. Yeah, is it zero one two? You have worked with Kafka, right? Yes. So there also we have something like this topics where we can publish our uh, whatever we want. The consumer can. Uh, attach themselves to these topics and listen to through the other end excellent yeah exactly so kafka is again a open source distributed event processing uh framework uh, with which um, you know you can publish a topic and publish messages to the topic and people can listen to the topic and read messages from the topic and use it for their use Okay, so it's called it's called a topic. Right? Kafka is a very very powerful platform. So if you uh, if you guys don't know, you have never read about Kafka. Please read about Kafka. Kafka is very very important. Okay, Kafka will uh, is is one of the important topic. I mean, if any of you would want to go in the stream of analytics, big data analytics, AI, ML, you should know Kafka. it's very simple in fact aws also has a kafka service managed kafka service aws managed kafka okay it's called msk 
Okay, it can provide a full Kafka service as a cluster. You just need to start using Kafka and you, you're ready from day one onwards. You don't have to build the Kafka cluster on your own. You just need to write the code. Okay. Thank you, Sajiru12. Yeah, so basically if you see that's that's Kafka and uh, you know where you have um, queues and topics. Topics is always with SNS. Uh, queues are with um, you know with with SQS. Okay, so some examples of what customers have done with SQS. SMS. Yeah, here also you have the same funda, right? Uh, standard topic and FIFO topic. Standard topic is uh, where you get the maximum throughput and best effort ordering. Whereas in FIFO, you get a high throughput, right? With 300 messages per second or 10 megabytes per second per FIFO topic whichever comes first and then strict ordering. It just sends the messages in the way it receives it. See all these can source the event, okay? Even sources such as EC2, S3, RDS, CloudWatch, can push it to an SNS topic. Like we saw an example last week, right? When we built a auto scaling example, uh, we pushed the messages to an SNS topic, correct? And that SNS topic sent out an email to our email addresses. This is something that we did last week, right? So EC2 can actually push it to an SNS topic. SNS topic can send it to your mailbox, respective mailbox or SMS or pager or whatever it is. Okay, so it, it has message fan out, message durability, encryption features, and also it supports SMS messages. You can send SMS messages, right? You can build a cool app, right? Uh, and, and in your app, you want to send SMS notifications to your end users. You can straight away use this. You don't have to use a third party SMS service. You can use SNS. So it's like supported in 200 plus countries using a highly available and durable service with redundancy across multiple SMS providers. Okay. All right, so that's Let's go to the pricing. Let's quickly review the pricing. Standard topic includes publishers, topic owner operations, and subscription topic owner operations. First 1 million SNS notifications are free every month. After that, it is 50 cents per 1 million request. Very similar to uh, SQS. And there's also some uh, pricing for SMS notifications. In a free tier, mobile push notifications, 1 million notifications are free. Mobile push, right? So where in the app you want to push, like how you get a notification within the app, right? Like Ola, uh, SBA card, uh, medium, right? Uh, how many of you have a medium subscription? Amazon, right? Amazon pushes notifications, right? So when you order, uh, when you order an item, Amazon, of course, sends you SMS also, but it also sends you a mobile push notification, which will be a notification that comes to your mobile device. That's that's this part. After that, it is like fifty cents per million notification SMS. Hundred notifications are free. And here the price varies from country to country. You can just review this. <clears throat> Email, 1,000 notifications are free. HTTP notifications, 100,000 notifications are free. 
yeah so that's that's about the pricing of sns i mean all this is kind of quite inexpensive right i mean you you get it at scale like right? you can you know you look if you look at the volumes they're all like million only i think less than a million like the minimum unit atomic unit is a million only not less than a million correct i mean uh, like sns sqs lambda right so they're all like talking in millions of volumes so imagine the scale imagine the uh, the volume at which you know aws operates all of these services right for millions of customers again you know customers are also millions of customers right i mean so so that you know so so look at the way you know these services have been engineered and these services are being managed in a real time right so that you know it can support you know bare minimum is a million nothing less than a million correct okay all right so that's that's on sns sqs and cognito so what what we are going to do now is to go to lambda let's go to lambda and run our first lambda function hello world function let's build an hello world function first i hope all of you were able to read through the lambda yesterday right you guys understood the usp of okay i'm just going to go here have 10 minutes yes we definitely have 10 minutes uh, let's get started with the hello world tutorial so click this link do your first steps in the aws lambda console you will learn very basic elements and deploy a simple lambda function just click here go here run a serverless hello world in this tutorial you will learn the basics of running code on aws lambda without provisioning or managing servers right you are not going to manage any servers we are not going to provision any ec2 instance we are not going to uh, you know um, you know deal with any route tables vpcs we are not going to deal with any uh, nacls we are not going to deal with any security groups we are not going to deal with any uh, uh you know yum update you're not going to deal with any uh, installation of software uh, we're not going to deal with going to slash where www html create a html page nothing to build our hello world function right you'll you will see that in a minute okay without provisioning or managing any servers we will walk you through how to create a hello world lambda function using the lambda console we will then show you how to manually invoke the lambda function using sample event data and review your output metrics everything done in this tutorial is free tier eligible okay let's go to the lambda console enter the lambda console i'm going to go to my lambda console i will type lambda go to the lambda console yeah this is how neat my lambda console looks like there's nothing in it it's all empty okay uh once you there uh you have a blueprint okay create a create a solution create a function click on create a function the lambda function uh, lambda console select create a function note the console page shows this page only if you do not have any lambda if you have created you will see lambda functions page on this page choose create a function right for example if i just go back So this is my this is my new user interface. I don't have any lambda function, zero lambda function. So I'll just go create a function. Okay. Next step, select blueprints. I'll select a blueprint, user blueprint. Okay. And then in the filter box, type in "Hello World Python." and select the hello world python blueprint just say hello world yeah blueprint name hello world python select this hello world python blueprint okay that's that's what it's asking us to do so it's using python 3.7 then click on configure click on configure yes so now let's come here give some basic information 
you uh, so now what it does is in step 3 a lambda function consists of code you provide associated dependencies and configurations configuration information you provide includes the compute resources you want to allocate for example memory execution timeout and the iam role that lambda can assume to execute your lambda function on your behalf right i mean if you recall iam session um, you're not going to use an iam user for system driven activities correct you will use an iam role because iam role is the one which is triggered by the system right on your behalf on your users behalf and you give privileges to the to an iam role right so the principle out here is basically a system or a service itself which is calling another service on your behalf so that's why iam role is very very important so that your lambda function can assume that role and invoke your lambda function on your behalf right like the example that we did last week no about uh, where in ec2 instance you provided an you associated an iam role to the ec2 instance and your ec2 instance was able to invoke s3 apis on your behalf there you didn't use a iam user right you used an iam role okay so you will now enter basic information about your lambda function hello world python is the name that i want to give okay i'll just go back i'll just give a name hello world python um role you will create an iam role referred to as an execution role okay the the role that you create out here it's called an execution role with the necessary permission that lambda can assume to invoke your lambda function on your behalf create new role from templates okay role name type is lambda basic execution okay um create a new role from templates right yeah, that's what we selected here create okay create a new role from aws policy templates yeah so here you get these templates you can use these templates where you get the basic permissions out here so these are all some templates that are, that are there right s3 object read only permissions scs bounds permissions recognition config rule recognition simple microservice permissions for dynamo db elastic search dynamo db cloud watch sns batch ec2 ami read only permissions sqs cloud formation cloud watch logs right anyway it it has changed a bit so now you just select a create a new role with basic lambda permissions that's what they want us to select lambda basic execution right so what it does is it has all the basic permissions for the lambda function to execute okay so just select this or you can use an existing role you can go you can create a new role from iam when i go to the role and create a new role okay i can select it's it's i want to i want lambda to call my service on my behalf right i'll select lambda and and my lambda has to basically um have permissions to um, you know you know just just call say ec2 instance or s3 right? then you can just go what permission you want to attach to it you want your lambda function to have a s3 read only access you can do that or if your lambda function should process a message from the queue you can use sqs if you have to, if it has to push a notification you can use sns if it has to use secrets manager you can use use secrets manager read write right uh, like that you know you can have your lambda function have policies associated with it or the lambda execution rule have policies associated with it so but here since this is a test i'm just going to go create a new role with basic lambda permissions we are going to see that i mean it, it would actually create a new role out here okay it will it will just come here in a while in the roles once i create it
Okay, role creation might take a few minutes. Please do not delete the role or edit the trust or permission policies in this role. Lambda will create a new execution role named Hello World Python. This is the role name that it is going to create, a random name that it gives with permission to upload logs to Amazon CloudWatch logs. Okay, you, you can also create it manually, right? Where you, you go to create a role, select Lambda, next permissions, say CloudWatch. Okay, uh, CloudWatch. Yeah, CloudWatch events full access. Or CloudWatch full access or logs full access. I think most probably it will create this. It will select this permission set. Okay, uh, CloudWatch logs full access is, is what it might create because here it's actually going to upload logs into CloudWatch logs. Okay. So anyways, let's see what, what it creates. Okay, let's come back. I'll just cancel this. Okay, I'm just going to search for that. It, right now it is not there, but in a while it will be there. And this is the code that it is going to import into your Lambda function. So it's a Python code, Python 3.7. Runtime is Python 3.7. Code is pre-configured by the chosen blueprint. You can configure it after you create the function. Right? After this, you can also change this code later on. Okay, right now also you can change your code, but you can also change this code later on. For now, I'm just going to leave it as it is because it's a sample template. Okay, and then I'm just going to go back and say create function. In this section, you can review the sample example code authored in Python and go to the bottom of the page and create function. Just go create this function. It'll take a while for the function to get created. So let's just wait for two to three minutes. The function will get created. Yeah, so it's created the function. Okay, hello world Python function is created. Uh, so if you go to version, so this is the latest version. You can also manage versions of your function. Dollar latest is always the latest version. And it also has a CloudWatch metrics, how many invocations, how much of duration, error count, and things like that. Then you can also do a function configuration out here. It uses it used this blueprint, hello world Python. Concurrency, I mean, um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this concurrency where you can throttle, okay? Uh, you can reserve the concurrency, right? Uh, you can reserve the concurrency or you can throttle the concurrency. Okay, and then you can copy there and you can delete the function, LESS. Code size is like 343 bytes. Okay, let's come back here. Yeah, currently you can author your Lambda function in uh, Java, Node.js, C Sharp, Go, or Python. Okay, this is like a slightly older tutorial. It's like using 2.7, but right now you're using so and so. Go switch to the old. So if you see here, uh, you can you can see that this is the designer that it gives, right? So where you the name of your function is hello world Python. Uh, right now it does not have any triggers or any destination, nothing of that sort. So this is your function code, uh, where it gives a small editor. It's it's very intuitive, where you can go modify the code. You can copy paste your code, right? And uh, you can also save save the code, right? And uh, you can you can do a bunch of editor ID. It's like a it's like a proper ID that it gives you. Okay, and uh, this is this is where the code is actually deployed, and and you can't access the underlying infrastructure where this is deployed. Okay, you won't be able to do that because every time the code executes, it spins up a new infra runs the code and then it terminates that infra. So that technology is called 
micro VMs, where it quickly provisions a small micro virtual machine. It's not an EC2 instance. It does not provision an EC2 instance. You may wonder, to provision an EC2 instance takes about 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or sometimes up to a minute, correct? So what if it provisions an EC2 instance every time it runs it? No, it does not provision an EC2 instance, right? It uses something called micro VMs and uses it uses a technology called Firecracker. Firecracker. Okay, it's basically a lightweight virtualization for serverless computing. You can read this. You can read this. It's, it's called Firecracker. Okay, it brings up a. It's a. It's a very micro virtual machine. It brings up that micro VM, and then it runs the code within that micro VM. Okay, now let me go back. Yeah. So here, if you see, um, you you get the code right, and then and then you get some functions, and then you get some actions that you can perform on test deploy and things like that. This is the editor. Then runtime settings, you get Python 3.7. So this is basically the handler, right? Um, so the handler is, you know, the one that gets executed, right? So when the, when the function runs in, right? So where if you see Lambda function dot Lambda underscore handler, you see, this is the Lambda underscore handler. This is like your main function. Static void main, right? I mean, this is like your main. Okay, there's no code signing, and you can pass environment variables to your Lambda function, right? You want to send some, set some variables for your code to run, you can pass that. It's like a key value pair. You can just pass it here. Okay, and then tags, you can add tags. Okay, the other settings are how much memory you are allocating to it. Right now, 128 MB of memory is allocated to it. And timeout is three seconds. It will time out in three seconds. If it doesn't run, if it doesn't respond back in three seconds, it will time out, it will throw an error. Okay, and it has 128 MB of memory allocated to it. You can't allocate CPU, okay? As I said yesterday, we, we would have read yesterday, right? That you can't allocate CPU to Lambda function. You can only allocate memory. So based on how much of memory that you allocate, your CPU that gets allocated to your Lambda function increases proportionately, right? Your function is allocated CPU proportional to the memory configured, right? If you increase it, yeah, if you make it one GB, you will get more CPU power. Anyways, I'll just make it the bare minimum 128 MB. Timeout is three seconds. Uh, you can make the timeout maximum of 15 minutes. Okay, in a Lambda function, uh, the, the timeout, the, the maximum time a Lambda function can run is 15 minutes. Okay, where you are doing some, uh, you're, you're waiting for some asynchronous call to come back and that asynchronous call is taking a lot of time. You can maximum wait till 15 minutes. After that, Lambda function will fail. So the maximum time out is 15 minutes, right? So it's not again a best practice to build an application, especially a serverless web application using Lambda, where you are waiting for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, right? You should not wait. That will impact the user experience. Rather, you should go for an asynchronous way of building applications where uh, if, a, if there is a long running task, offload that wrong, long running task to a asynchronous handler or choose a different style of architecture where uh, you use a batch operation behind the scenes where you're not impacting the user experience, end user's experience. Rather, you are uh, passing that long running task to the end user and making the end user uh, wait, uh, I, I mean, so it, you're not making the end user wait. You're only offloading it to a batch process, a batch job behind the scenes where the batch job will execute and batch job will run the code behind the scenes. Okay, uh, yeah, and execution role is, this is the execution role. So if I go back and refresh, I would actually see this execution role. See, I saw this, I got this execution role created. 
when my when i created my lambda function i click on that execution role and uh, i want to see what permissions it has you expand this yeah so if you see it has a it's a loving on action called create or create log group i love create log stream put log events so these are the two actions three actions that it is allowing and for resources which is the principle here they are in us my hello world python lambda function can perform these actions on my behalf on my users behalf okay so that's the <clears throat> yeah cloud watch logs right so it created that so now what we'll do is we'll just go back i'll just cancel this i'm going to go back yeah so you can just yeah you can also run your lambda function within your vpc also right uh, right now i'm not running it in vpc so by default what happens is when lambda functions execute they need some networking they need some compute correct so if you don't run run it inside your vpc um if you don't run it inside your vpc it will by default run it in um aws vpc aws managed vpc aws managed vpc has got select for managed services mm -hmm. aws has got some vpcs okay which is managed by aws so it runs within the aws managed vpc where you don't have to worry about it you don't care you just want your function to run but then though that you don't care where it runs correct it runs in your vpc or aws vpc you don't care but certain cases where you want to be more secure where your information security policies or your company's information security policies mandate that any code runs it has to run within your networking components which is well monitored which is uh, which is guarded through a firewall and things like that so then in that case you have to run it in a vpc in this case you can also choose to run it in your own vpc okay then you have to choose the subnets where you have, where it has to run you can choose it choose multiple subnets then you have to give a security group okay um so that you know uh, you allow the inbound and outbound communication to that lambda function okay but otherwise if you don't do anything it will it will just run in a aws managed vpc okay for now i'm just going to do that okay then if you want to add a file system right i mean you have to first create a file system and associate the associate the file system you can also create state machine which can orchestrate this using step functions uh and concurrency i'll come back to this concurrency later yeah and then asynchronous in invocation it, it can try twice two times okay uh and if you want to add database proxies through which you know your lambda function needs to talk to a database right you can use this database proxy to uh create a proxy like rds proxy right we created a we looked at an rds proxy or something like that so you can just create a database proxy and add any use just come back so now let's invoke the lambda function and let's see how the hello world event is coming up right uh step 4 invoke lambda function and verify the results select configure test event from the drop down menu called selected test event select a test event configure test events so here choose hello world so these are like sample templates that are provided event templates that are provided okay so just select the hello world template event template okay and then just give a name to it called hello world event just give a name to it okay and then what you do is uh, you can replace you can change the values in the sample json but don't change the event structure for this tutorial replace value one with hello world okay uh, so just change it to hello world hello rpl champs Okay, that's the name that I'm giving. You can just uh, retain retain the remaining as it is. That's not a problem. Okay, don't change the structure of this whole thing, right? You can just say 
E1 is hello RPL chimes. Okay. Uh, and then say, say create and then click on create. So this is going to create a test events which you can which you can test. So now uh, just say test, click on test. Okay. So yeah, so when you click on test, the Lambda function is executed successfully it, it successfully executed you expand these details yeah you see here it's actually giving hello rpl champs it's returning hello rpl champs and it will also give you a lot more details about that particular execution it took about 1.64 milliseconds and it's built for like two milliseconds right and then uh, resource configured this 128 megabytes was was allocated to that but it used about 47 megabytes okay and this is the output where it started the function it passed three values to the python code value one is hello rpl chance value two is value two value three and then it completed right and so this also goes to cloud watch logs i'll just click on this logs in another tab it goes to a cloud watch log Yeah, so if you go to CloudWatch logs, go to CloudWatch. On the left side, click on log groups. You will create a new, it, it would it would have created a new log group called slash AWS slash Lambda slash Hello World Python. Open that. And this, has, this will find some streams. You will find some streams that are coming from Lambda executions. Open that, this is like 1st December. It will have a date, it will have what is the version of the code? Okay, and then you will see that. Okay, if you go back, yeah, you see that everything is logged. All the, the entire execution of the Lambda function is logged out here. So just on us text here yeah. the entire execution is locked started and it said a view value one hello world okay and then yeah so it, it this is the output basically this is this is what the lambda function has returned so if you want to understand what what it runs so this is this is the lambda event handler right it's basically an event driven programming correct uh, so this is the event handler you are defining a uh, uh, you're, you're just doing importing JSON. Okay, that's that's a library that gets imported. Then you're just saying printing loading function. So if you go back to your uh, logs, you will see that it is loading function. Okay. So then what you are doing is, this is any is, uh, you know, commented out, so leave it. So you're just printing the values that are being passed to the Lambda function where event it's, it's all part of the event right because that's where you're passing the values as key one key two key three right that's what your test event has got right if you go to configure test events you have key one key two key three right i'll just say hello world hello universe okay i'm just going to save this let me pass values for all the three. I'll just say test. Yeah, it, it executed it. Yeah. Okay, it's not printing all the three, anyways. Yeah, it's, it's like only returning event of key one. Okay, that's what it is returning, but it's actually printing all the three. If you go back and look at the logs, it would have printed all the three. Yeah, yeah, see, see here. Hello, RPL champs, hello world, hello universe. Okay, it's, it's printed all the three values. It, it printed all the three values. Okay, so, and then, uh, so, yeah, but, but it's returning just, 
event of key one right so that's this is a simple python code nothing nothing great about it it's just a simple python code that's it you can run this even outside of lambda right and just run this even outside uh, where you pass the values of key one key two key three uh, value one value two value three you know it's it's just going to print this thing that's it Okay, it's just a sample template. That's it, just to test the lambda execution, right? But see how quick it's actually executing the lambda function, right? I mean, let me just test it once again. Yeah, one point four milliseconds it executed. Yeah, it just executed it in one point four milliseconds, and it would have just charged me only for that execution. So whereas if I if I were to run the same Python code on an EC two instance. I should at least go for a minimum bare minimum t two dot micro, correct? And then the t two dot micro, I have to ensure that I make the uh, I update the uh, operating system. I install Python. I open the security groups, right? Uh, I open the knuckles, right? I allow access to. Oh, coming from the world outside world, right? I, I have to do all of that. I need to associate an elastic IP address, and all of that I need to associate, correct? Whereas here, if you see, it's all completely eliminated. All that you're doing is you're simply uh, creating a new lambda function, right? And you're you're just simply going ahead and executing the lambda function. And you, if you have an existing code, you can also bring that existing code within the lambda function. That is also possible, right? So you can learn more about it. Basically, AWS Lambda uh, import existing code, import Python modules, right? You can learn about this, and and you can also, if if your if your Lambda function is a Java based Lambda function, uh, then what you can do is you can also bring your jar files. Okay, you would have built jar files, right? How many of you know what a jar file is? Can someone unmute and explain what a jar file is? In Java. Z012, Z011. A32, have you all not worked with jar files? Yeah, A36, A36, wanted to say? Uh, no, sir, actually, I have a, I have a brief idea on jar files, but I don't know what exactly it is. Like, uh, it's okay. it is a Whatever type idea of, you have, you can speak about it. Uh, it is type of a zip file, but we use in, uh, Java, I think so, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Sir, I think it's in application dot jar dot where. So basically, jar is a Java archive file. So where when you uh, Java, build your application, um, like this, sir. you have multiple classes. Yeah, you have multiple classes. Uh, you you collate all these classes together as a jar file. And uh, you know your jar file will get loaded in memory, and then it will execute the code in memory. That's a jar file. So when you have a jar file, you can import the jar file into this, into the Lambda console, right? And then you can also use a Java based Lambda function. Like for example, you want to create a function, just create a function. You can give a function name. I'll just say my test function, and you can use a runtime. What runtime that you want? You want to go for a .NET Core or Go 1.x, Java 11, Node.js, Python 3.8, Ruby 2.7. Okay, so these are all the frameworks that are supported by Lambda function. It supports pretty much everything, correct? All the major programming languages it supports, right? Uh, if you see a lot of applications are actually built on Java, .NET, Node.js, Python. Okay, so if you just select a 
Java, and we'll just go here. The create function. Yeah, just create the function. Yeah, so here what you can do is you can you can just go ahead and import a uh, um, import your Java jar file into the lambda function so that you know your jar file runs here. Okay. So anyways, let's come back. I'm just going to delete this. So if you just create a Lambda function, it's not going to be charged. You can create as many Lambda functions as you want. It's not going to be charged. You're not going to be charged. Only when you run for that particular execution, it will get charged. Okay, you got it. I mean, that's the beauty of Lambda functions, right? That's the beauty of serverless architecture. It, you're not going to be charged by default. Right? You will be charged only when you run it or only when you execute it. Like for example, in this case, I'm executing it. Click on test. So whatever time that my code ran, 2.47 milliseconds, I will be charged only for that. In this case, I'm charged for three milliseconds. Next to the nearest uh, round off. Okay, and uh, what does the free tier gives? Yeah, 1 million free requests per month. Okay, and you get 1 million free requests per month with up to 3.2 million seconds of compute time per month, which is like huge, right? I'm in, I can keep, I can sit the whole day today and keep hitting test, 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 test. Yes, test, 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 test. See how fast it is responding. Okay, I can keep doing this all day today. Okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done even twenty times by now. Right. So. So, so yeah, feel free to kind of go explore this, run the code. If you want, you can run your own code on this. If you have other Lambda functions, you can just bring the other Lambda functions and run it here, right? <clears throat> Search for some samples. AWS Lambda Python sample. Sample code. Let's run a few other sample codes. Yeah, see, this is another sample code. It's like importing OS, Lambda handler, OS dot what to print, how many times, uh, then it's iterating through a for loop. Okay, it's basically getting it from the environment variable if you, if you see. Yeah, you're setting up an environment variable, how many times, five. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, nice cool stuff that you can do with uh, Lambda, okay? And in fact, uh, so, so one way is, I mean, a lot of, I've seen a lot of applications use Lambda functions to, um, to, to supply the business logic to your application, correct? So where you have, they create multiple Lambda functions 
right? And because it's a function, right? At the end of the day, you can just create multiple lambda functions. And uh, what what they do is they orchestrate this entire lambda function using a uh, using step functions. Step functions again, as I said yesterday, is a state machine workflow. You can orchestrate the multiple lambda functions using step machine workflows. Uh, and uh, what they do is they uh, interface it with an API gateway. API gateway is something that we're going to see tomorrow. Okay, we're going to learn about API gateway tomorrow. Okay, so now with the same hello world Python Lambda functions, we will interface it with an API gateway and then we will invoke the Lambda function from outside, from the public internet, right? Where it returns hello RPL champs. We will use the same Lambda function for tomorrow. Okay, so use API gateway and using API gateway, you know, you build a Angular JS application, a small Angular JS application, uh, and you host that Angular JS application in an S3 bucket. Right, S3 bucket, you can use it as a website hosting, right? So you can host it in an S3 bucket and use the, uh, you know, run the AngularJS. Uh, AngularJS would make an API call to API gateway. API gateway would make a call to Lambda function. Lambda function would make a call to DynamoDB uh, or any other databases behind the scenes. And then it would return the uh, results back to end users. Right, we are going to actually do one full lab on Thursday and Friday using Lambda, API Gateway, uh, DynamoDB, um, S, uh, SNS, S3, and CloudFront. These are the six services that we're going to use on Thursday and Friday. I'm going to give you a similar lab guide using these six services and uh, you're going to do this going to build a complete serverless web application, you know, without configuring any servers, without using any servers. You're not using any servers, right? I mean, in this case, anywhere did you configure the operating system? Hmm? Did you configure any operating system here? Or did you say that I'm using Windows, I'm using Linux? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Yeah, anywhere no, did sir. you update your operating system? No, yum, sir. sudo yum update hyphen y did you do? No. Did you install any software? Sudo yum install, mm -hmm. sudo yum install Python. No, sir. Nothing, right? No, yeah. So all you did was you just did configurations, everything from within a browser. Right, and uh, all that you did was you only selected what runtime that you want. In this case, the runtime that I want is Python 3.7, that's it. I can edit that runtime, I can make it anything else also. Okay, I can make it Node.js, I can make it Java, I can make it .NET. I can change the runtime to anything. If any of you know .NET, I mean, you can also create a function in .NET. Use a blueprint. Uh, I'll just say .NET Core, right? So these are all sample templates that are available. I'll just use these templates. This is a Hello world, Node.js, Node.js sample. Yeah, in fact, if you see, this is in S3 get object, Node.js S3 get object. If you have S3 objects, you can just use this sample template to get it. Or there's also serverless app repository, okay? You can browse this where you will have public applications where people would have published. You can use this also. See, people have built Alexa skills. Uh, what is an Alexa skill? Can somebody tell me what an Alexa skill is?
nobody used Alexa. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Please tell me. Go ahead. I think, sir. I think it's like a Jarvis. It's like interrogation, interrogator, man. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. How many? How many of you know what a Siri is? Siri, Siri. Hey, Siri. Do you guys know what a hey Siri is? What is hey Siri? Um, it is uh, it is present in uh, Apple products, sir, like uh, Apple, Apple phones and something. Uh, when we want, like it is just like Google. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is just like Google, sir. Like when mm -hmm. we want something, uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, open that Siri and we can ask, sir. So that it is an AI, related sir. answers. Yeah. Okay. So Alexa. It is an right? AI. Yeah, Voice yeah. controlled software. Alexa. So you all know this Echo Dot, right? Echo speakers, smart speakers, Echo smart speakers. Do you, have you uh, have you seen that, or have you used it? Echo smart speakers. Okay, so basically, Alexa is a. Uh, it's a it's an AAML uh, service from Amazon, right? So where it recognizes for your voice, right? It's a voice recognition service uh, where it uses your voice recognition and then it basically controls the devices. Okay, it can recognize your voice. So now Alexa is basically like a virtual assistant. Okay, it's a virtual assistant AI developed by Amazon. Okay, the first thing that uh, Alexa was uh, was embedded was in a Echo smart speaker. Okay, Echo is a smart speaker. In fact, I can show you Echo uh, sometime later. I have got an Echo speaker with me. I can show you. So it's basically a small speaker uh, where it you you just voice control it, right? You can say that Alexa, play a song for me. Okay, it's going to immediately come and play a song for me, right? Based on my voice recognition. And uh, there are so many skills that Alexa can support. In fact, uh, if you see, um, the, the uh, people, are, people are actually building a lot of skills, okay? I mean, not only for controlling speakers. Uh, in fact, uh, there are smart plugs, like home appliances, right? Uh, you have home appliances, right? So where um, in, in home appliances, so you want to basically say, Alexa, switch off the light or switch on the light. It'll, it'll automatically switch on the light. Right and uh, smart homes, right? Even cars have got Alexa skills in it, right? So where you can say that Alexa start the car, car or Alexa start the set the thermostat to 24 degrees, set the car AC to 24 degrees, right? So that way, you know, it supports so many languages and it's getting popular day by day. And there's so much of uh, thing that is there for Alexa, right? I'm just trying to play a video. Alexa, help me keep up with the daily news. Oh, there are a bunch of different ways to stay informed, hands-free. All you need is an Echo device in the Alexa app. We'll start with the basics. To get caught up while you're doing other stuff, just ask Alexa to play the news. You can use your voice to skip, pause, or go back. It even works with Fire TV and tablets. Okay, Alexa, play the news. Okay, here's the news. Alexa, pause. I forgot to set my intention. Want breaking news alerts? Say, Alexa, enable news notifications from NPR. Short on time? Flash briefings will get you what you need in a jiffy. Here's how to pick your favorite providers. Open the Alexa app. Go to settings. Select flash briefing. 
tap the plus icon, tap the ones you want, and hit enable to use. To give it a listen on its own, say, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? To make it part of your morning ritual, use the start my day routine. Okay, I like to start my day on a high note, so I'll add everyday positivity to the end of my routine. Okay, Alexa, start my day. Good morning, Pam. Today, you can look for partly sunny weather with a high of 72 and a low of 55. Did you know that hands and feet contain more than half of all the bones in an adult human body? Now for your flash briefing. Oh, I was not prepared for that kind of news. Oh, one more thing. If there's a topic you're curious about that wasn't covered in your daily briefings, you guessed it. <laughs> Just ask Alexa. Alexa, what's happening with pop culture? Okay, that's it for today. Whew. Give it a try at home. And please be safe. I nailed those puzzles. Yeah, you okay? Okay, that's cool, right? I mean, uh, you know, you can all install Alexa app in your mobile device, okay? If you have a iPhone or Android, right? Uh, just, just install Alexa in your phone devices and then you can train Alexa, right? You can train the Alexa to um, recognize your voice and uh, you can ask Alexa to play anything. You can ask Alexa like to play the news briefing. You can ask Alexa to play news uh, or play a song, or you can ask any informative things to Alexa. Right? You can ask Alexa to, on certain things, Alexa, uh, speak about uh, what is Amazon EC2, right? You can also say that. Just give me a second. I'm, I have Alexa in my mobile. Let me open Alexa. And let me ask Alexa to read about, tell me what an EC2 instance is, right? One second, I'm just going to do that. Okay, I'm just going to ask, and then I'll, I'm going to put it on speaker, okay? Alexa, what is Amazon EC2 service? According to Wikipedia, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud is a part of Amazon.com's cloud computing platform, Amazon Web Services, that allows users to rent virtual computers on which to run their own computer applications. EC2 encourages scalable deployment of applications by providing a web service through which a user can boot an Amazon machine image to configure a virtual machine, which Amazon calls an instance, containing any software desired. Cool, isn't it cool, right? It's just trying to, uh, you know, uh, so what you can do is, I mean, when you're not really feeling quite, um, you're feeling quite lazy to look at the computer screen and read through a subject. What you can do is you can simply ask Alexa and say that, um, read out certain things for me, right? I mean, for example, in this case, uh, I want to understand more about, uh, um, uh, you know, say I want, I want to learn more about DNS service, right? So I can ask Alexa, Alexa, what is a DNS service? Here's something I found on the web. According to wikipedia.org, a DNS hosting service is a service that runs domain name system servers. Thanks, Alexa. Can you explain what a SSL handshake is? Alexa, what is SSL handshake? Here's something I found on the web. According to Bildung.com, SSL handshakes are a mechanism by which a client and server establish the trust and logistics required to secure their connection over the network. Uh, Alexa, what is the weather today? Currently, in Hyderabad, it's 25 degrees Celsius with fog. Today, you can expect mostly sunny weather with a high of 26 degrees and a low of 15 degrees. Yeah, so you can ask anything to Alexa, right? I mean, so that way you, you actually are training Alexa over a period of time, okay? And uh, 
and also uh, you know alexa is used uh, in a lot of home equipments right and in industrial equipments right so and you can voice control uh, you know alexa to execute commands on your behalf okay and uh, you can you can also make phone calls using alexa right and so many nice features are there and you can actually run a lambda function using alexa <laughs> okay can you believe that in fact you can run a lambda function and you can write you can put put something in a lambda function that says that uh, uh, you know you have to uh, say say when you are actually starting from your office okay so let's imagine a scenario right things are things have come back to normal and you're all going to office and we're all going to offices so uh, probably 20 minutes before you reach home right uh, you have a uh you have a smart water heater at home okay uh, because once you come back home you actually have a shower and uh, you have a smart water heater at home right uh so 20 minutes before you reach home right you want to ensure that you know the water heater is on and uh, water is warm enough so that you can have your shower right so you can write a lambda function uh, which can uh, receive an event from alexa and uh, which can uh, you know trigger the event uh, through which you know your water water heater uh, has an iot uh, device in it right and then it basically uh, you know starts the water heater okay uh, your geyser your water heater right so that way so uh, you know that you know you are stuck in a traffic and the next 20 minutes you will reach home right you can simply start your alexa on your mobile you can you can just speak to your mobile device saying that alexa turn on my water heater that's it so then in response to that what alexa can do is alexa can trigger a lambda function and the lambda function can invoke that api which will uh, speak to my uh, thermostat device in in the uh, water heater and then it will send a signal to the water heater saying start the water heater turn on the water heater okay so that's 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 how you can actually control you can make alexa work with uh, lambda functions and uh, you know that's very easy uh, i just saw some um alexa device alexa things out here so i thought okay i'll just yeah see alexa skills and right? you can just select this yeah this alexa sample skill is a template for a basic fact skill provided a list of interesting facts about a topic alexa will select a fact at a random and tell it to the user when the skill is invoked okay so this is the template this is the template okay it's, it's a node node.js node.js uh, alexa skill okay so yeah i mean so it's quite cool actually right i mean you can use lambda api gateway alexa um, iot right again iot services there in aws you can use iot service also okay so yeah i mean that's it for today uh, i mean you can go through these i mean this this lot of interesting things that you can do with lambda functions alexa uh, and uh, so so much is possible right i mean in fact uh, you can use lambda function along with iot to actually monitor your devices in for example in a in a factory right or in a assembly line right and you can immediately respond faster to back to events yeah see this amazon alexa coming home yeah see this month after the lights went out alexa pause my podcast alexa set the temperature at home to 71 degrees and turn on the lights Alexa, call Mike. Thanks, hun. Have fun at work. Yeah. See, what this gentleman did was he just was driving home and he said, "Alexa, set the temperature to seventy-two degrees, and turn on the lights." Right. So, so you can just. smart homes right i mean if you see smart homes there's so much of smart homes 
the routines that are available in alexa using echo from mobile devices see the bare minimum that you can do today is if you don't have a echo device that's okay you can, you can just install alexa application in uh android yeah just install this in your lamp in your mobile devices from your google play store or apple play app store just install this log in using your amazon credentials and then start using it you will have fun with it <clears throat> okay all right so let's go back so what what i want you to do today is i'll give you this link you can try this okay so the only thing is that uh, when you try this uh, when you go to your uh, lambda function uh, when when you go to your console turn off this the updated console okay because the experience is slightly different uh, the tutorial uh, the steps that are mentioned in this tutorial is pertaining to the old user interface so you, you have to turn it off okay so are we all clear don't keep this on then you will get confused so turn this off okay and then execute this example okay, i'm going to give you i'm going to give you this in the document okay uh first to december Lambda SMS SQS secrets manager. Okay. Yeah. So SMS. Probably as SMS. this sns sqs secrets manager secrets manager you don't have to do a uh, you know a lab i mean if you, if you want you can do it later uh, but yeah i mean imagine, i mean uh, just remember it's a paid service but it's only like free for one month uh, after that it's charged quite hi so i would so just not to do secret manager anyways it's secret manager is pretty simple there's nothing much to yeah and then run this project run serverless run a serverless hello rpl champs using lambda functions so yeah ensure you turn off the new console <laughs> updated console updated console on the top left hand side of the aws console okay turn it off Okay, just follow the steps in this 
I think you should be good. Also, you can go and check the CloudWatch logs, okay? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you this. So, in the chat. So tomorrow we are going to look at API Gateway. And then we are going to use API Gateway along with Lambda to do some cool stuff. Um, and DynamoDB also. Tomorrow we'll do DynamoDB and API Gateway. Okay, so yeah, so I'll let you all go into your breakout rooms and uh, read through this and complete this assignment for today. Run the hello world Lambda function for today. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Thank you for joining and we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, Thursday and Friday is going to be our serverless assignment, serverless lab project, project number two. So that's going to be even more interesting. Um, so, but yeah, but ensure that, you know, um, those who of you participated today, participate tomorrow also, because it will be a logical extension of today's assignment and uh, which will be helpful for you when you do the assignment or the project on Thursday and Friday. Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Sai, uh, Sai Krishna brother, over to you. Thanks mentors. I'll see you all tomorrow. Excuse me, sir. Sai Ram. Yeah. Sir, uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you say that we can uh, log in with the uh, AWS credentials into the Amazon Alexa, sir? No, no, you can't use your AWS credentials. You okay, need, to need to register with Amazon. Yeah, yeah, you need to create with uh, an Amazon ID. Yeah, okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay, register with Amazon, like how you have a Google ID, right? Similarly, yeah. you need an Amazon account. Use that Amazon account to uh, log into your Amazon Alexa. Yeah, okay, sir. Like, okay. Uh, it is like uh, uh, similar to the another apps, no, sir? Like, uh, there are no some charges and etc. Et no, no, no charge. It's free. It's free. Yeah, Alexa is free. Yeah, thank you, sir. I guess I missed that. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, then I'll see you all tomorrow and watch watch some of those videos these videos in Amazon Alexa YouTube channel. It's quite interesting. Okay. Okay, all right. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. Saramana, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, we'll Saram, open the breakout rooms now then. Sure, thank you. Saram, have a good day, all of you. Thanks. Bye. Sure, no, thank you. Bye, Sairam. Guys, please do join your breakout rooms.